can you uh, then zoom back in to specific problems with Starship or any engineering problems you work on? Can you try to introspect your particular biological neural network, your thinking process, and describe how you think through problems, through different engineering and design problems? Is there like a systematic process? You've spoken about first principles thinking, but yeah, is there a kind of absolutely. process to it? Well, um, you know, like saying like, like physics is low and everything else is a recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, like I've met a lot of people who can break the law, but uh, I haven't met anyone who could break physics. <laughs> so, uh, so the first, for, you know, any kind of technology problem, you have to sort of just make sure you're not violating physics. Um, and, you know, uh, first principles analysis, I think is something that can be applied to really any walk of life, uh, any, anything really. It's just, it's, it's really just saying, um, you know, let's, let's boil something down to the most fundamental, uh, principles, the things that we are most confident are true at a foundational level. And that sets your, at your, sets your axiomatic base. And then you reason up from there and then you cross check your conclusion against the, the axiomatic truths. Um, so, um, you know, some basics in physics would be like, are you violating conservation of energy or momentum or something like that? You know, then you, you're, it's not going to work. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's, the, you know, so that's just to establish, is, is it, is it possible? And then I, another good physics tool is thinking about things in the limit. If you, if you take a particular thing and you, uh, scale it to a very large number or to a very small number, how does, how do things change? Um, both like temporal, like in number of things you manufacture or something like that. And then in time. Yeah. Like let's say, say take an example of like, um, like manufacturing, which I think is just a very underrated problem. Um, and, and, uh, like I said, it, it's, it's much harder to take a, 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 an advanced technology product and bring it into volume manufacturing than it is to design it in the first place. My orders of magnitude. So, um, so let's say you're trying to figure out is, um, like why is this, this, uh, part or product expensive? Is it um, because of something fundamentally foolish that we're doing? Or is it because our volume is too low? And so then you say, okay, well, what if our volume was a million units a year? Is it still expensive? That's what I mean by like, thinking about things in the limit. If it's still expensive at a million units a year, then volume is not the reason why your thing is expensive. There's something fundamental about the design. And then you then can focus on the com reducing the complexity or something like that in the design. Change the design to change change the part to be something that is uh, uh, not fundamentally expensive. But but it, it, like that's a common thing in rocketry because the the unit volume is is relatively low, and so a common excuse would be, well, it's expensive because our unit volume is low, um, and if we were in like automotive or something like that or consumer electronics, then our costs would be lower. I'm like I'm like okay, so let's say. We skip, now you're making a million units a year. Is it still expensive? If the answer is yes, then uh, economies of scale are not the issue. Do you throw into manufacturing, do you throw like supply chain, you talked about resources and materials and stuff like that. Do you throw that into the calculation of trying to reason from first principles, like how we're gonna make the supply chain work here? Yeah, yeah. And then the cost of materials, things like that, or is that yeah, too much? Uh, exactly. So, um, like another, like a good example, I think of thinking about things uh, in the limit is um, if you take any, uh, you know, any any product, any machine, or whatever, um, like take a rocket or whatever, uh, and say um, if you've got, if, if you look at the raw, if, raw materials in the rocket, um, so you're going to have like. A, I don't know, aluminum, steel, titanium, ink and uh, special uh, specialty alloys, um, copper, and and you say, what are the how, what what what's the weight of the constituent elements of of each of these elements, and what is their raw material value, and that sets the asymptotic limit for how uh, low the cost of the vehicle can be, unless you change the the materials, so. And then when you do that, I call it like maybe the magic wand number or something like that. So that would be like if you had the, you know, a, 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 like just a, a pile of these raw materials here and you could wave the magic wand and rearrange the atoms into the final shape. Um, that would be the 
lowest possible cost that you can make this thing for unless you change the materials. So then, and that is always a, usually, almost always a, a very low number. Um, so then the, the, what's actually causing things to be expensive is how you put the atoms into the desired shape. Yeah, I actually, if you don't mind me taking a tiny tangent, I had a, I often talk to Jim Keller, who's somebody who worked with you as a, oh, yeah. as a friend. Oh yeah, Jim was, a, yeah, did great work at Tesla. So um, I suppose he carries the flame of the same kind of thinking that mm -hmm. you're you're talking about now. Um, and I, I guess I see that same thing at, at Tesla and, and uh, SpaceX folks who work there, they kind of learn this way of thinking and it kind of, becomes obvious almost. But anyway, I had um, argument, not argument, uh, he educated me about how cheap it might be to manufacture a Tesla bot. We just, we had an argument. What is, how can you reduce the cost of scale of, of producing a robot? Because so I've gotten the chance to interact quite a bit, um, obviously in, in the academic circles with humanoid robots and then my Boston Dynamics and sure. stuff like that. And they're, they're very expensive to, to build. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jim kind of schooled me on saying like, okay, like this kind of first principles thinking of how can we get the cost of mm -hmm. manufacture down? Um, I suppose you do that, you have done uh, that kind of thinking for Tesla bot and for all kinds of all kinds of complex systems that are traditionally seen as complex. And you say, okay, how can we simplify everything down? Yeah. I, I mean, I think if you, if you are really good at manufacturing, you can basically make at high volume, you can basically make anything for a cost that asymptotically approaches the raw, raw material value of the constituents, plus any intellectual property that you need to license <laughs> anything. Right. But it's it's hard. It's not like that's a very hard thing to do. But but it is possible for anything. Anything in volume can be made, of, like I said, for a cost that asymptotically approaches its raw material uh, constituents plus intellectual property license rights. So what will often happen in trying to design a product is is people will start with the tools and and, and parts and methods that they are familiar with, um, and then and, and try to create. A, the product using their existing tools and methods. Um, the other way to think about it is uh, actually imagine the try to imagine the platonic ideal of the perfect product or technology, whatever it might be, um, and say so what is this? What what is the perfect arrangement of atoms that would be the the best possible product? And now let us try to figure out how to get the atoms in that shape. I mean, it's it sounds. Um... Uh, it's almost like Rick and Morty absurd until you start to really think about it. And it, you really should think about it in this way because yeah. everything else is kind of, uh, uh, if, if you think uh, you, you might fall victim to the momentum of the way things were done in the past, unless you think in this way. Well, just as a function of inertia, people will uh, want to use the same tools and methods that they are familiar with. Um, they just, that's what they'll do by default. Yeah. Um, and then that, that will lead to an outcome of things that can be made with those tools and methods, but is unlikely to be the um, platonic ideal of the perfect product. Um, so then, so that's why it, it's good to think of things in both directions. So like, what can we build with the tools that we have? But then, but, but also what is the, what is the perfect, the theoretical perfect product look like? And, and that, that theoretical perfect product is going to be a moving target because as you learn more, the, definition of or, or for that perfect product will, will change because you don't actually know what the perfect product is but you can successfully approximate uh, a, a more perfect product um, so think about it like that and then saying okay now what tools methods materials whatever do we need to create in order to get the atoms in that shape but, but for people very rarely think about it that way but it's a powerful tool <laughs>